Thank you. Um, wait, I just share my screen. We are good to go. I see it. Perfect. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to sharing uh, what we've been doing in Herring Run Park and our project. Um, so these are the preliminary findings. Uh, we had a few project goals going into the project. And so the most important one was to conduct a phase one archaeological survey of the remaining unsurveyed areas of the park. So in years prior, there have been a few groups that have gone out and done some research, mostly in the northern parts of the park. Um, and so we wanted to, to kind of expand on that to get a better understanding of how the park was utilized throughout time. And um, we figured the best way to do this is to conduct a phase one survey, which um, consists is a kind of a systematic survey and of digging um, shovel test pits. So kind of 30 centimeter holes in the ground um, along transects. And so that kind of gets us a good understanding of what might have been there um, without having to dig larger trenches throughout the park. Um, and so that was our first goal. We finished that for right now. Um, we also hosted two community outreach days. Um, we wanted to really get the community involved in the history of the park since most people use the park. And so we wanted to introduce them to the history that was under their feet as they traverse through the park. Um, and then we also are in the process of a laboratory analysis of what we recovered from the phase one investigations. We have two undergraduate students who will be taking it on this semester. And so that will be really helpful in understanding what we found and how it relates to the people that would have lived along the Herring Run. And then additionally, we want to conduct a ground penetrating radar survey of probable archaeological feature locations that are that they were buried beneath two to four feet of fill as the park was being developed. Um, so as they wanted to kind of make the park a picturesque, a picturesque place and kind of create areas for people to gather and do some recreational activities, um, they kind of covered some of the potential archaeological features um, with the soil that would have been in the areas that they developed. So uh, a good way to see what might be there is through a ground penetrating radar survey. And so that kind of uses, it's a way to kind of scan the ground without having to dig. And so it's a way to see what might be there. And then after that, we'll go in and, and we'll dig some holes to kind of confirm what the ground penetrating radar survey saw. So the reason that we wanted to take on this project was to add to the cultural context of the area, especially pre-contact sites. So we really have a, a kind of gap in our understanding of the indigenous people who lived here before colonization. Um, and especially like where these pre-contact sites are. And so we figured that the park would be a great area to explore this. Um, it's relatively undisturbed compared to the rest of Baltimore. Um, and we also know um, the Friends of Herring Run, um, or I'm sorry, the Herring Run Archaeology Project has done um, projects there and they have found pre-contact sites so we kind of wanted to see if there were more where they were located and so that was important to us and then there is also coming up a 2024 Towson University Field School and so we really wanted to find a good site for them to work at to give hands-on um, techniques that undergraduates could learn as they go into the field of archaeology and so that would help having both pre-contact and post-contact um, features and sites in the same area um, really helps them understand the different techniques used in 
those different sites. And then we also wanted to develop a relationship with many different communities. That's the Baltimore Community Archaeology Lab is kind of focused on developing these relationships and bringing the outside uh, community non-archaeologists into our research so that we can better learn and better understand what we can do for the communities that we work with. So we wanted to focus on members of local intertribal indigenous groups, including the Piscataway Kanoi tribe. Um, we wanted to talk to the community who lives around Herring Run Park and who uses it on a daily basis. Um, we wanted to develop a relationship with the Friends of Herring Run Park and then also you, the National His Natural Histo History Society of Maryland. Um, and so thank you for having me. This is kind of part of that and I look forward to the future. Um, it's our pleasure. Thank you. So th these are site maps. So you can see the left map has kind of the outline of what's considered the park boundary. And then also it has the areas previously surveyed and then areas that we're hoping to GPR survey in the future. And then all of the yellow are the survey areas that we were hoping to get to or survey areas that we hope to get to in the future. And so I think there's 23 in total. Um, we only got to around five. So that's the map on the right can show the survey areas that we did complete. Um, so it was a good start, definitely. Um, but it, we, it's just a big project. So we have a lot that we want to get to and we're hoping to get some good information as we continue with this project. So just for a brief historical context to give our findings some context. Um, so as was said before, groups of people have been living along Herring Run since around 9,500 BCE. Um, the Herring Run Archaeology Project discovered a site in the northern part of the park that gave us this early date. And so we know that they were there that early, the indigenous community. Um, and so we want to see what other types of sites there were. Are there later sites than that? Are there earlier sites than that? And where they chose to settle? Um, and so that kind of gave us a background of like what we could find. Um, and then as Baltimore began to grow, the Europeans began to settle along Herring Run because it had a good potential for farmlands. And then also the water, the Herring Run itself was a great spot to have mills. So typically grist mills and cotton mills. Um, it was a good location to kind of produce those products. Um, through mills. And then in the early 1900s, Herring Run Park was created. And so ever since it's been an urban oasis for the community. And so we kind of going into this project, what just wanted to understand how the land was used throughout the this long period of time and um, just give us an insight onto the landscape. And so you can see this is one of the maps that we found. And so we have these large estates um, and then it's likely that there were houses along the run and so it just gives us an idea of who was occupying the land in the post-contact um, time period and kind of what they were doing with it. This is a newspaper article from the Baltimore Sun um, and so this kind of gives a list of all the mills. It says there were seven mills, um, and then most of them were grist mills, so producing flour, and then there was one cotton mill. And so this really kind of gives an idea of how many mills were in the area and what the uh, land was used for. And then it can kind of help us understand where these mills might be, because comparing the names that are associated with the mills to the maps that we found, um, it can kind of help us understand what area these mills were. So moving into the phase one survey, it was conducted by myself and two undergraduates. And so there were 23 survey areas and then we only got to five, but it was a good start. Before we kind of dug into the ground, um, we did some soil probing. So 
it's kind of inserting a cylindrical probe into the ground um, and it gives us a good idea of if the soils were natural, if they had a good stratigraphy, we could see the first level, the second level, third level, um, all the way down, or if they were disturbed, if there were a bunch of different levels, if there was some clay in there, um, if there was sand from flood deposits. So just to understand what we might be getting into um, and what areas we wanted to kind of focus on, because the undisturbed areas are obviously what we want to look into first to see what was there um, and hopefully it would still be intact. And so we uh, dug a total of 427 shovel test pits, so across those survey areas. And then for survey area six, that was the first survey area we developed or we excavated in. Um, and we had 26 positive shovel test pits out of 107. So less than half, um, around a quarter of the shovel test pits were positive. Um, and in these positive shovel tests, we found positive means um, that we found artifacts in them or we found a feature in them. And so we found many historical artifacts such as ceramics and glass and metal objects. There was um, some like modern glass, like bottle glass as well, um, mostly in the top level. So it was kind of hard to, to understand like what was actually historic or what was just tossed modern in modern garbage. Um, but we did find those. Um, and then one SDP was positive for pre-contact debitage. So you can see in that picture, a bunch of small little flakes that we found, but this was an exciting find for us because um, it shows that pre-contact people were in the survey area. Um, and then this find prompted further investigation in our two public outreach sessions. Um, so I'll get to that a little later. This is kind of a map to show where the positives were. And so you can kind of see patterns. Um, and then the map to the right shows which were pre-contact and which were post-contact and where those were located. So for survey area four, that was kind of a dud survey area. We didn't find any positives, no artifacts or anything. Um, and we could tell it was heavily disturbed. We dug down to one meter and that's what you can see in those pictures. It was it's kind of hard, <laughs> it was very deep. Um, so that's why the uh, Nick who I worked with was completely upside down in that picture. Um, so just to understand what was there and if it was disturbed and how it was disturbed. And so once we determined that these this survey area was disturbed by mostly flooding, um, we moved on to 30 meter transects instead of the usual 15. So um, that just kind of let us not have to dig more holes in areas that we didn't think there would be anything intact there. And so that helped us get through this area faster and move to survey area five. Um, this was across the river from survey area six, which you'll be able to see in the map in the next slide. Um, so there were 17 positives out of 43 shovel tests. And we found a greater um, array of historic artifacts in this one. So we found bricks, snails, ceramic, and glass, as well as a byproduct material. So um, we kind of thought that this may be an area where there was a structure given the brick and the nails. Um, we didn't exactly find a feature until we got to one shovel test pit, which had a layer of bricks or mor mortar. Um, and so since it was a pretty compact layer, um, it's possible that there was a structure there and more investigation will help determine that. Um, and so that will really be integral to seeing if there was either a house in this area or potentially since there was a lot of byproducts such as slag, um, that byproduct might have been from the mills, like the production of the mills. Um, so that's possible as well, though we're not entirely sure right now. Um, so here's the map. You can see the at the top of the map that sort of rectangular 
uh, survey area was survey area six. So we can kind of understand how it um, the two survey areas relate to each other being on each side of the river. Um, and then we also did find in one shovel test pit, we found some pre-contacts like debitage, those flakes from the stone tools. Um, and so that was also important to note. Um, it was found with historic artifacts, so likely not in context, but just to know that there were this these types of artifacts in this area is important for understanding what the indigenous lifestyle would be along these the river. Um, and so that is kind of an overview of that survey area. Um, moving into survey area three, this was a little further upstream from survey area, the passport survey area. Um, there were 33 positives, so about a third um, out of 90 SDPs. Um, and then this was probably the closest to Herring Run, just based on the topography. They all kind of bordered Herring Run, um, but we could kind of tell that at some point, the part of the survey area that was the closest to Herring Run may have been part of the Herring Run um, because we found a lot of sandy deposits. Um, and like, as you got closer to Herring Run, the artifacts looked to be like smooth by water. So kind of like sea glass where it was like rolled through the water. So that kind of suggests that the land that we were excavating may have been underwater at some point or just on the banks, like very close to the shoreline of the, the um, river. And so that was interesting. And it also kind of, it was hard to excavate this area. So you can see in this picture, there were kind of bands of sand. And then once you got further, um, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but the walls would just kind of crumble in on themselves because it was just straight sand. Um, and so we did find artifacts in this area, but it's hard to say if they were like in the intact, the um, context that they were originally used in intact um, because of this heavy disturbance in these areas and the unusual stratigraphy that went with them. So this is kind of a good map. We, depending on, um, once we hit some of these really sandy disturbed um, shovel test pits, we kind of stopped the transect that we were working on. And so that's why some of the, uh, in the positive neg negative map, some of them are um, white for unexcavated, um, but, it still gives us a sense of what was there and where it was. And then our final, final survey area was survey area nine. There were 52 positives out of 163 shovel tests. Um, and then as we were excavating, there, there was a forested area and then there was kind of like a soccer field area or just kind of an area that we could tell was might have been flattened or it, it's, it was like a lawn area as opposed to that forested area that was closer to Herring Run. So the forested area seemed to be intact, but then many of the shovel tests in the field had clay. So if you can kind of see in the top um, picture, there's like bright red and white inclusions. And so that's kind of like a clay fill that we kind of saw. Um, and so in that area, we moved to 30 meter intervals instead of 15. And we kind of determined that, that those artifacts were likely just the context was disturbed when they put in that soccer field. Um, and then we also found the same types of historic artifacts. Um, we found ceramics, glass, metal, brick byproduct. Um, and then the we only found a few smaller pieces um and so and we didn't find any features to suggest a structure in this area so that will have to be investigated further or potentially um the evidence of a structure was disturbed in some way 
that's kind of what we ran into a lot um, was a lot of the ground was disturbed. And so it's hard to understand what people were there and how they used the landscape when it was disturbed through different development, developmental projects um, of the park. Um, and so additionally for the survey area, one shovel test had lithic debitage. Um, and so that will also be investigated in the future. Since this was our last survey area, it got cold. So we'll go out later and, and investigate that. But for right now, our, our season is finished. Our field season is finished. Um, so this is the maps for this area. You can see it's, again, mostly historic artifacts or post-contact. Um, and then there is that one uh, shovel tests that had both pre-contact and post-contact artifacts. So one of the more fun parts of this project was having community outreach days. Our first one was in November. Um, and so this was after we found that um, shovel test pit that had the debitage all the way back in survey area six. And so we kind of determined like that would be a good place to look. The um, where we found that there was a nice like open area in the forest and it was close to herring run so it was had the potential to be a good place for a settlement um so we wanted to see if we could find evidence of a settlement a pre-contact settlement or just kind of understand where these flakes came from um and so we placed five meter radials um, in each direction around the original test pit. And so north, south, east, and west, um, we placed those five meters away from the original shovel test pit. And that's kind of standard to understand like why this test pit had something in it and what else, like, is this a site that we're looking at or is it just kind of an isolated find? And it was just, there, there were just artifacts there, but they, they don't relate to a larger site. Um, but this particular shovel test pit did relate to a larger site. We discovered more lithic flakes, um, including an unfinished point. So here's an example. A lot of the um, lithics in this area was quartz and quartzite. And so these are natural to the region. So that kind of tells us that they were utilizing what was around them. Um, and then um, we also found like a smaller hammer stone, which is a pr pretty cool find. I couldn't find any pictures of it, um, but it kind of showed that they were producing stone tools in this area. And especially the more lithic flakes told us that this was probably a small lithic production site, um, but we didn't find any evidence that it was a settlement. And so then in the second community outreach day, we continued to investigate um, we did 2.5 meter radials to kind of narrow in on what this site was and the extent of it, how big it was. Um, and then we also opened up two one meter by one meter test units um, to kind of understand. And we put those around where we put the last test unit from community outreach day number one. Um, and so we kind of continue to find features related to stone tool production. Um, we found a, a pit where a lot of the flakes came out of. So it suggests that whoever was making these stone tools kind of dug a pit to put all the excess um, flakes into, kind of to throw them away in, in a sense. Um, and so we continue to find flakes as well. So someone was making stone tools in this area um, and it wasn't a huge site so far we can't tell so it might have been one person it might have been two people like a small group um, what's interesting was in one of the higher levels so um, earlier than the lithic debitage we also found a bunch of pool tabs so it kind of shows the the difference in the use of this area of someone was drinking some beers in modern times and then way back when in the same area um someone was making stone tools so I just thought that was a cool 
coincidence or kind of connection throughout history. So that was that project. Um, we did, we kind of were able to fulfill some of our goals, but we definitely have more going forward. And so in the beginning of February, we will be conducting that ground penetrating radar survey. And so that will really help us understand that part of the park. And the benefit of the ground penetrating radar survey is that we can cover a large area of land in a very short amount of time because the ground penetrating radar is on like a cart and you just kind of, it's kind of like a lawn mower. You push it throughout the site that you want to kind of investigate. And so it's a good way to understand what's under the ground without having to dig and put in all that manpower. So we're hoping for some good results from that. Um, and then we're also hoping to do a lab community outreach session in February. So processing the artifacts that we've been finding from all these survey areas um, and then inviting members of the community to help us wash the artifacts and catalog the artifacts and show up what we found because it's a really interesting area and it's cool to show the artifacts that we've been finding. And then in March, um, the Baltimore Community Archaeology Lab is going to present the research from the park at the Middle Atlantic Archaeological Conference in Ocean City, Maryland. So that's, I think, the second weekend of March. So that'll be nice to be able to show what we've been doing and kind of also get input on the research. Um, and then there is a field school scheduled for May to July 2024. So I think that field school will be investigating the, um, the site that we investigated on the community outreach days. Um, and so if you know any college students who are interested in a field school. Um, I think we're still accepting applications. You can find more information on our Facebook page. So we have some exciting things coming up. Um, and I, I think that's all I have. Thank you for having me and I would love to answer any questions. Michaela, one of the words that you used a couple times was debitage. Um, yes. And as, as a non-expert, can you explain a little about what that is? Right. Okay. Yeah. So debitage is basically the um, refuge, I guess, like the, the flakes from when they would produce stone tools. Um, they would usually, when you would make like a arrowhead projectile point type thing, um, they would do that through breaking off flakes um, through percussion um, and pressure and such. And so the the kind of leftover from making that stone tool is called debitage. So sorry, I should have explained that earlier. No, thank you. I appreciate that. So I see uh, we have one hand up um, and then there's also a question in the chat. So okay. here we go. Hey, so um, that was an awesome presentation. Very, very impressive. Um, how do you know that a piece of like rock that you find that's like in quartzite, especially because it's like sort of fractury, you know, um, yes. is like is a point or a tool or whatever? And how do you date them once you find them? Right. Yeah. So, yes, I as I'm more of a post contact historic person. So I've kind of been learning that um, there are some kind of unique parts of a flake or of a potential productile point as well. So you kind of look for the place that someone would have struck the core material that they were making the projectile point out of. And so there will usually be um, a part of the flake that that is the place where the hammerstone struck it. And so that is like a platform type thing. And then from the platform on the opposite side is kind of a bulb um it's like a divot in it I guess um and so that also kind of tells you and then there's also sometimes ripples throughout the the piece of flake um that um is when that percussion like that sound wave travels through the rock um and breaks off of it um you can kind of see that through 
the flake. And so it's definitely kind of difficult to determine, but once you've seen enough projectile points and flakes, you kind of get the hang of it. Um, did I answer your question fully or did you have another? Yeah, that's great. And you said you are more into like the historical period artifacts, I guess, like um, how do you even, how do you um, figure out whether a piece, like you said, a piece of glass could be from a beer bottle or something more recent. How do you figure out that it's from further back? Right. <laughs> and yeah. then I'm um, yeah, things. So, yeah, so there's definitely, I mean, there's been so much research on all types of artifacts of how to date. So I remember you asked how to date the kind of pre-contact artifacts. Um, if we can get a good projectile point, like the, t the style of projectile point usually will relate to a time period. I don't think that projectile point I showed you has a good like diagnostic style, um, or maybe we'll find that out in the lab processing. Um, so, but that's kind of the way projectile points are really helpful in dating a site. Um, and then for historic, so for the glass example, modern glass is much thinner. Um, and it also has smaller seams. So, cause it was made by a machine, it has some small seams. Um, and then, um, it's kind of a thinner glass. And also when we find glass on the surface or right in the first level, and it's that thinner glass, it's kind of easier to suggest that it's modern bottle glass because it was so early. Once we get into the deeper levels and we find thicker glass and we find other historic ceramics and such, um, it's easier to think that those are historic artifacts. Um, so yeah, and then thank it's you awesome. yeah yeah that's, for that's great thank you the style yes okay any other questions should I look in the chat um okay uh were there any mill head slash tail races noticed during the survey so no we weren't able to see anything related to that um hopefully once we do further investigation, um, those radials that I was talking about that we did for that community outreach sessions, um, uh, we'll be able to understand more, um, but we didn't see any kind of substantial features like that. Um, are there any early 1600s writing letters, reports, et cetera, that refer to the people li that lived in this area? Yes. So there are some historical accounts, um, and I'm still kind of going through that um, to understand. And then it's it's more broad. It's more Baltimore County in general of the people that lived here. We do know that the Piscataway people, like once Europeans encountered them, the Piscataway people and the Susquehannock typically lived in this region. So um, those were kind of the groups that were encountered, encountered by the early European settlers. Um, and then eventually they were pushed into um, camps and, and such like that and pushed off the land. Um, so we do know that kind of, um, we, we have an idea of what happened to them during European um, colonization. Um, but prior to that, um, like there are some sources, but they're, they're not extensive. So, and then I said, did you say you were going to invite volunteers to hunt with you? If I said hunt, I must have misspoken um, to volunteers to um, like, excavate with us and um, hunting for like, knowledge yes hunting for knowledge exactly and kind of do that systematic um excavation or in the lab type thing so um if you can and, uh share some of the calls for volunteers with me i can share that with the group who are here today later yes yeah we, yeah that would be great we don't have a date for february yet but we will we'll get that to you as soon as we do um, and then what happens to the records and results of investigations like these or the digs BCAL has done? Are they ever posted online? So yes, we're working now to have more of an online presence. Um, and so once we kind of organize our thoughts and um, get into writing reports and um, 
articles on this. We will likely post them to our Facebook page and also um, make that more readily available to anyone interested in the project. So I think that's all the comments. Does anybody else have any more questions? I just wanted to say thank you. I think um, that was really super exciting as somebody who's hung out in Herring Run Park for like 30 years and never knew that this stuff was ever there. That was really, really cool to find out. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I second that. It was really awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time, Michaela. This is uh, my first experience with the archaeology, but it was very nice. Thank you, great. Michaela. Yeah, great. Perfect. We like Our that. next meeting will be uh, February 21st. Again, it's the third Wednesday of every month. Other questions? All right, I appreciate you all. Thanks so much. Um, take care, everyone. Michaela, thank you so much. And we'll, we'll be sure to be in touch. And I will pass on any information you might want to provide to those folks who are here. And we can take it from there. Good work. Thank you so much. Thank you.